So welcome everybody. We are recording now and uh, welcome to this, the fourth session, I understand, of our short course with Western Sydney University. And we uh, have the pleasure again to have Dr. Kay Carroll with us who will be speaking about high impact assessment. I'll leave that all up to her. Now, um, just so that everybody's aware, um, don't forget that I'll be sending you any information regarding the handouts, any information regarding the, the recordings, any information about future events, just have a look at the chat, go through the chat and, uh, and you'll find the links. I'm gonna be sending you a few links this evening um, and don't forget that again, we are recording, it'll be made available to you and the material that uh, uh, Dr. Carroll has provided will be made available to you. So I'll be giving you um, uh, uh, any notes or the presentation that she has prepared for you um, after this session. So, over to, uh, over to Kay Carroll. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you um, this evening. I, I know that some of you are across Sydney and Greater Western Sydney, and I hope that you're all safe and well. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to come and chat to you again about high impact assessment and feedback. And I'm hoping we have some really strong conversations and it's just wonderful to be part of your evening. And I invite questions um, in the chat at different sections. And I hope that you find this very useful in terms of your work in community language classrooms. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's get started. So hopefully you can see, uh, let's just check that everyone can see the actual screen that has Western Sydney. If you could just give me a thumbs up so that I can see that you, that is correct. Or if Alex is there, if you can let me know that whether you can see the Western Absolutely. Sydney. Absolutely, all good Kate, yes. Great, thank you so much. All right, so let's get started. Um, oh, I think I've started right at the end. So I might need to just let me, give me one moment. Let's just hit that and go right to the front. I think I was testing it before. So let's start again. So uh, what we're going to cover today is looking at assessment impact in your classrooms uh, from primary all the way through to secondary and look at some different ways that you can create quality assessment tasks that are engaging for students, that meet all of our outcomes and that really develop their skills. So let's start by thinking about what we're going to unpack. So I firstly want to talk about assessment and how important that is in terms of teaching, but really important in terms of our kids and our students to make sure that they actually get a good picture of where they are with their learning. Clearly, uh, providing feedback is important to our learners and also to our community and to our parents. So we're going to unpack a little bit about what is assessment and what are the different types. We're going to look at some actual models that I encourage you to try out with your classrooms. And I've tried to choose examples across different languages and also across different years and stages. And then obviously look at the importance of providing really quality feedback to our students. So I'm just going to move this down a little bit so you can see. Okay, so that's a little bit about the overview. And I guess it's important to know that in teaching and learning, assessment has so many different purposes. It's linked to what we teach, how we teach it into our daily lesson plans. Um, it's not just the what happens at the end, it happens along the way, particularly when we look at even our graduate teaching standards that you are all working um, with, as well as the curriculum. And it's so important that we provide that feedback to our students so that they know exactly where they are. We know that in languages in particular, it's really important that students feel uh, that they're growing and developing their language proficiency, that they develop a little bit of self-belief or self-efficacy. So they know I can do this, I can master this, even though it may be challenging. And it's particularly important because they have to apply their understanding. It's not just written, there's a strong oral dimension to it. And we know that that self-belief, that confidence is what encourages them to continue and to de develop proficiency, which is obviously really important. And they can learn a whole lot of things along the way and that they can use this 
to help them pinpoint where they are in the classroom and also when they take those skills home. So really, really important. Um, how do you do it? It's a bit of a challenge. Uh, sometimes when you say assessment or tests or we're going to do this, students get really anxious and that may not give you the best picture or snapshot of where they are. It's a little tricky assessment uh, and obviously um, different people have different views and the way we do it may have an impact on what we understand about the learner. So hopefully this is very practical and useful um, to give you some tips and some things to think about when you're preparing for this. So, oh gosh, assessment means everything, doesn't it? I mean, the word is so um, loaded in terms of the importance, also the anxiety, uh, also the feedback it provides. It's such a, a great tool for us as teachers, although our students may not think like that. And I, I guess I want to encourage you to consider a lots of formative, possibly informal tasks that happen along the way and how we can use that evidence daily. Uh, and I guess I want you to consider what makes quality assessment. So I'm going to try something and it's a little bit of a, a, a trial. So uh, please bear with me. Some of you I noticed last session in the chat told me that you use Kahoots, which is a great digital uh, ICT form of quizzing or polling. And I thought hopefully this works. We might be able to do a Kahoot quiz tonight. Um, perhaps while you're on the Zoom, if you don't have a mobile device with you, or if you do have your phones or a, a tablet somewhere close by or on the computer itself, if you can open up another tab and maybe play cahoots with us about assessment and let's see what your responses are and get a bit of a snapshot of our group tonight, our cohort of learners about what our ideas and perceptions around assessment are. So there's six questions and if you haven't played Kahoot before, I'll take you to a website and within that website is a URL for Kahoot. It's a funny word, it's spelled K-A-H-O-O-T. So, and um, then with, there's a game pin. So there's a six digit number for you to enter once you go to the website and then we'll play as a group. Hopefully this works. So I'm gonna take you off share now and move you over to the Kahoot quiz. So. Off we go and then let's go over to our quiz when we can find that. Just takes a minute, there we go. And I'm gonna share a different screen. I hope you can see the Kahoot screen. All good. Okay, are we ready? Please tell me if if you can't see the Kahoot screen, maybe a thumbs up again from fantastic. Thanks, Aisha. Great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna play and then a pin will pop up and you're, you need to go to the URL and then pop in the pin. Just takes a second. Hopefully you're still following my screen. So, you can see here, here's the URL, www.kahoot.it, or you can join with the app. There's a little thinking music for you. And here is your pin. It's actually a seven digit pin. Welcome Caroline and Cheryl. Great, I've got a few people joining us and Rachel. Fantastic, all the names are popping in now. So we have uh, just under sort of 15 or so ready to play. I'll just give people another minute or so. It's terrible music, isn't it? Maybe if I change it. Oh, 
I'll just give people one more minute. I can see so many names. It's so lovely that you're joining in. Thanks so much for doing that. Okay, it looks like we're, we're getting ready to go. I know there's a big group of you, so if we just bear with me for a minute. Okay. I think that's most of us now who are online. Okay, I think, and if you haven't quite joined us, I think um, you'll get the idea. It keeps resetting. So I hope that we can get started in a second. Okay, I think we can probably get ready now. Okay, it's such a big group. I might ask for people to not to join now so we can actually play. And if you're not quite sure, you can play along with us as we come through. Okay, here's our question. Assessment, this is how we're going to start. And there's six questions all together. So they're just questions. Assessment makes me feel unwell. This is you, the teacher and the student. Happy once it's completed, helps me to learn effectively or makes me scared. And I guess it's important for us to think as teachers about this perspective of assessment that our students may have. We only have a few seconds. Already we see so many people, fantastic. So obviously um, it's a number of things and we see how people have responded. Caroline, it looks like you're right at the top there. Fantastic, our second question. Assessment in community languages, classrooms could include, so here's some examples, speaking tasks in pairs, writing in the language about different topics, understanding vocabulary, or creating projects or presentations. What could it include? And you might like to choose more than one if you're possible. Fantastic. So you can see here that all of those answers are, would be a great type of task for a community languages classroom. And we can see here the scoreboard as well, although I can't see any scores popping up just yet. So I should only assess at the end of each topic. So it's a true, false, not sure, or you can assess throughout each lesson at the end of the topic. Lots of answers coming in. So again, you can assess each lesson and also at the end of the topic. So we start to see some points coming up now, which is fantastic. I think we're on to our fourth question. Students can only be given an A or a good mark at the end of the term of the learning. So is that true, false, only when they demonstrate an A or high level response or only at the end of the term or the completion of the year? When can we give them that really high grade? Lots of answers coming in right on the cut there. So we can give them that A when they demonstrate it, regardless of whenever that time is in the school term or in our program. I think we're up to our nearly our penultimate question. Feedback is only for parents. Is that true or is it false? Pretty straightforward. So counting down, just an easy one now to think about the importance of feedback and who are our stakeholders with feedback. So clearly it's for both our students and our parents and our other uh, community uh, teachers. So we're moving up. La Shaila looks like doing very well. And our last question, peer and self-assessment is very useful for students in community languages classrooms. So getting them to self-assess and also work with their peers, how useful could that be for our students? True and false, it's a little bit quicker. I can see lots of answers coming in, which is fantastic. And 
It is very useful and it's great to see everyone respond with those types of answers. That's great that you recognise or are currently using it. So here we are. We're on our podium. So I need to play the music. And our winner, yes, Shaila, well done. Lots of stars and glitter and fantastic work from all our runners up and our participants as well. Um, really positive and I'll just get rid of all this now, but I hope that um, everyone enjoyed paying cahoots. So that's that. And we might now stop share and I'll reshare. Um, cahoots is a great um, fun to get students engaged. Oh, you've got that terrible music. That's the problem with cahoots. It just keeps going on. I'll just get rid of that. having real problems, shutting it down. Apologies, everyone. Kahoot went over, um, overtook us all, but I hope you enjoy that and it's a whole lot of fun. And it's a good way to get to do informal assessment is to have regular quizzes and to get students to think about their answers in an engaging way that's not stressful, but encourages participation so that you can get everyone included. All right, so let's get back to this and let's move forward. So, Assessment obviously is more than the, the traditional essay or very formal testing, although it is still very much a collection of what students have achieved and we're going to collect evidence. Um, in all of our New South Wales syllabuses, they talk about assessment for learning and the whole importance of assessment in allowing students to show what they can do and to do it in a way that is authentic and realistic. So in our community languages classroom, that's clearly got to be centred on quality assessment. So assessment occurs all the time. It's not something that just happens at the end of a term, although clearly there may be a need to do that more formally, but it should be happening throughout each and every lesson, assessing where the learners are, what their next step will be. And it's a, about letting them shine a little. So enabling students to say, this is what I can do and demonstrate it. And it helps you to, I guess, take that next step or plan that next activity. So assessment should be part of any cycle of a lesson. Um, some of the things that you can do are like that Kahoot quiz, but it could be an exit card. I often take post-it notes with me to class and I ask them to write down three things that they learnt um, two things that they want to find more about and maybe one thing that they'd really like to do in tomorrow or the next class the following week. And I get a little ticket at the end that they give to me and it's a good way to check in that students are engaging or if they're having troubles with anything or if they're really interested in a particular topic so you can plan something to take it to the next step. So exit cards are a really fun and engaging way to assess learning not very stressful for students and really give you a snapshot. And we call that informal or along the way assessment. But there are other types obviously that we're gonna look at today that may fall more into the you know, assessment for learning or even the summative. So assessment activities, here's a, a quick little um, run sheet of what they should be doing. I think the idea that they uh, do demonstrate things in a range of contexts Clearly we need to give our students more than one chance to have a go at something and to demonstrate what they can do. It's really important that we make sure that they're accurate. So we are getting a good snapshot. And if students are expected to do something formally, we want them to have success criteria so that they can actually uh, demonstrate or achieve what we're actually asking them to do. 
Where do you start? Well, I'll take you through that in a minute, but essentially we're looking at the outcomes and breaking them down. And then obviously when we've done all of those things, we wanna make sure that it's done over a period of time, that it's including all of our learners, that we're capturing them at their best and that we can reflect on what was achieved and what wasn't. Sometimes it happens that we teach it and you think, but they didn't get it. They didn't learn it. Um, I'm sure I taught it and that could be the problem. It might be that we need to learn more effectively um, to find out where the students are at. So here's a little bit of a, a how-to, very quick, um, just a number of quick steps, five quick steps. Start with your outcomes, always start with them. I like to circle what the key verbs are in my outcomes so I know exactly what I need to assess. I need to think about what evidence is required from the learning. So what do I actually have to gather? Um, what is going to be a good account of students learning? How will I gather it? Will it be happening along the way at the end of the term? Will I do it over a series of lessons, particularly if I wanna capture speaking? I may not be able to do that in a whole classroom. I need to think about what content will allow them to develop that and at what point? How will I provide the feedback? Will it be informal? Will it be in writing? Will it be a report comment? And have I really got enough evidence to say they can or cannot do these things and to what level? So these are some quick questions to ask ourselves when we're planning from the outcomes. So I think you're ready now. I think we've had um, a bit of an introduction into what is assessment and how to do it and where to start. Let's take that deep dive now. Let's go and have a look at some examples. So it's a little bit more practical and helps unpack what we've talked about. So here we go. So let's start with languages. Languages is huge. Um, I know that we have so many participants tonight, which is fantastic. And you all are experts and teachers in a variety, so many rich languages. So I've taken the ACARA statement, I guess, to look very broadly at languages, even though obviously in New South Wales, you're working with many of those syllabuses. So one of the, I guess, important strands or substrands of the languages area is to think about the importance of socialising. You know, that ability to, to write and speak, to use oral language, to engage with different ideas, um, thoughts, take action, um, participate. So I guess it's really being having that background in the language. And you want students to be doing things, speaking and listening orally, as well as writing. And you want them to be able to do that. So these are the key concepts of which you might base some of those socialising or language exchanges. Um, there's so many of them, you can see they're quite rich. And then obviously the text types that you need to be thinking about. So how do I set this up? What are the types of exchanges or texts that students need to engage with, both in the oral form, speaking and listening, but also in the written form? And they need to be authentic. So you can see here, there's lots of different things. I see some hands and I might come back to those um, in a moment, but I do have your comments there, Andrea. So I will come back to you. So, Hopefully everyone's following and seeing my screen. I hope that's all good. Hey, can I just, uh, can I just intervene just very quickly? I think the, um, the screen is yeah, very small. We can't read, we can't read it. Um, the presentation, it's, it's not in presentation mode. I think it's in teacher presentation. I hope you can all hear me. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. We yes. can hear yes. you. Yes. Yes. Make sure my sound is up. Right, I'm, yep, yeah, sorry, a few technical problems for me tonight. I need to, let's try again. Top in the orange? Yes, that's better. That's much better. Is it? Are you getting the whole screen now? Okay, could I just, could I just suggest that if, while, while we're here, and, and I've interrupted already, I'm so sorry, so you might as well you might as well increase it in the top orange bar on the left you've got the icons we've got the save the the undo arrow you've got you've got a, a screen with the on the left in the orange if you just click that that'll that'll increase the size I... but it's much better already up okay. up 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 to the right to the right Oop. 
just it was just there. You were just there. Okay. That one there to the one the one to the left of that. That's it. If you click that, we should be fine. Yeah. That one there. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's it's actually not working for me very well. So that's okay. My <laughs> my apologies for the share screen. Um, I don't know why it's doing that, but let's um. That's not helping, is it? Apologies. Uh, okay. Really not, not very working very well for me. <laughs> Let me just um, see if I can move it across. How does that, is that better for people now? Yes, it's, it's much better now. Okay. All right, great. So you should see the ACARA Australian Curriculum Languages screen, is that correct? Yes. Great, all right, so we're on the right screen. So it's around interacting. So remember I said I circle the outcomes and I look at what I need the students to do in an authentic way. So I want them to socialize, I want them to do it with interaction, to build relationships and to participate. So these are important things that I want to bring out when I'm going to construct an assessment task. So what does that mean? It means that obviously I wanna do these types of tasks and activities. And then clearly I wanna choose appropriate text types that work to do these types of tasks in this context. And then obviously I need to include written as well as oral tasks. So here's an example of how we could do it. So remember we talked about text types, so for oral, for speaking and listening, maybe we could create a debate. And we have to ask ourselves these questions all the time when constructing assessment tasks. You know, is it relevant to what students need to do in terms of the big concepts? Is it authentic? Does it allow for them to collaborate or negotiate, which is one of the appropriate ways that we want them to um, be involved? Is it something that requires them to be autonomous and be independent? Um, can we include any measures of self-assessment? So um, these are the important questions. So I've chosen a debate, but I have to think about these types of contexts and how I could create it. Another example might be telephone conversations. How could I create one um, for students to engage with? And that can you know, be simulated in the classroom um, it could be done um, through actual technology as well. And I need to, again, think about, do I need to um, add a dimension? Should I give them a, a topic? Is there a particular context? Will this type of activity allow them to engage in higher order thinking? I've, um, so this is really important to get us to think about the types of tasks and how we create it. So, Another example could be a class blog. So a class blog um, could be something that we could get them to be doing their written communication in. It could be ongoing. And if I think about it, it's highly relevant to the types of communication that students are actually participating in um, because they do need to think about exchanging ideas. They often use Google Forms or Google Classrooms. And so you can think about these types of tasks. So this is important questions for us before we even um, get to deliver the task, getting us to think through how many opportunities does this involve for our students? So here's an example of one that's worked through a little bit more. Um, you can think about getting them to give them a context is really important. So, sorry, Kay, can I just interrupt? Of course. Um, Andrea here, your Andrea, um, yes. screen doesn't seem to be moving up. Everyone is um, commenting on the side that it's still frozen on page on uh, sheet number six, but I think you're quite a bit further along. I am indeed. Oh dear. All right. I'm seem to be having, I will, um, just, Thank you. Sorry for that. I'll no, no, again. it's great. I, I don't want you to miss it because I think it's really important. I just don't know. I'll just have to um, just go back in again and reopen everything. So no problem at all. Thanks, Andrea, for, for bearing with me and being so patient and letting me know. Okay, let's see if we can um, move forward. 
to here. And let me just see if I can reshare our screen as well. Oh, here we are. Do you have class blog, Andrea? Can you let me know? Yes, we do. Beautiful. Oh, you've Perfect. missed my, my beautiful slides, but I guess the same questions apply. So I think you heard it. So I won't go back, but you will get a copy of this. So I guess a class blog is a written communication piece. It's um, something that you could get them to do. And then you could ask yourself as a teacher, you know, is it allowing all of these things? Um, particularly, does it allow for that collaborative and independent dimension? Now, here is a task um, that goes a little bit further. It describes the context. So in this particular task, uh, you can see it's a cultural reflection journal. So you could give them that and they could do it as a blog. Um, they're given a, a particular context, describe a cross-cultural experience at a sister school. And this one is set based on you know, a, a trip, for example. So there's a, a cultural dimension and you know, they have to include some reflections and the reflections are about particular aspects. So the Chinese cultural values, attitudes or sense of identity. You can see here, while this is an example of a task, you could choose another language teaching area and create a similar task. Part two is to think about giving them an oral context. So the first one is writing, could be to write and deliver a speech in the actual language. And um, they could do this by using technology as well. So they could use some ICT or do some research um, by getting some feedback from different students or they could even use some video as part of that presentation. And the part three is to lead a discussion. So remember we talked about collaborative and autonomous opportunities, independent opportunities. So they have to actually lead a class discussion and I guess about a particular a topic and the topic they're given is to finalize their itinerary and send plans. So they have to get the whole class to agree to what's going to be on that itinerary. Again, trying to give them an authentic and realistic context. So that's an example of something that has all those different dimensions. It's probably more a summative or a bigger task, and it would be considered assessment for learning. So um, that's just one example. And I have a couple more for us to have a think about and see whether we might fit some of these ones in. So if you look at the task that I'm going to show you now, often we need to remember that they have different parts to them. And this is a little picture from Bloom's Taxonomy that I'm sure you know well. And what I find helpful when constructing high impact assessment tasks is to try and have tasks that allow for different levels of connection. So I might have a task where they have to demonstrate understanding and then a task where they have to apply. So they have to do something in a new way. And then maybe a task where they create a presentation or they communicate um, what they've learned at that high level at that creating. So uh, there's a couple of different, I guess, verbs here that I find really useful. So sometimes I use some of this to guide the assessment task. So I start with my outcome, I think about the context, I think about the text, and then to create the task and the layers to make it sure that it is sort of allowing students to demonstrate all that they know, I might try and think about using these types of imperatives or verbs, things that I want them to do with the task and noting that these things are much higher order and that students will find much more interesting or engaging, but also more challenging to demonstrate. Whereas these ones at this level are more about identifying and perhaps understanding and then moving up. And a good summative task or an assessment for learning task would probably have elements of some of these features. It wouldn't just stay at this level here, it would move up all the way through, if that makes sense. So here we go, let's have a look at some tasks. Is that okay with people um, that we, we have a, a close look at some examples? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, all right. So um, some of these you've probably done and, and, um, and you can let us know uh, maybe in the question session how that's going. So 
write a letter introducing yourself. A great diagnostic task. You can ask them to write it in um, the language that you're teaching or perhaps in English to start with, to get a sense of what their interests are, their background, um, but it's also getting them to communicate. So it can seem very informal, but can give you as a teacher a lot of information. When I get my students to do a task, I, I actually think about these questions. Is this something that they would do? Um, clearly they would learn how to introduce themselves. Do they actually do this? Is it authentic? And would this task be something that would be motivating or enjoyable or fun? So I think it's important to, to think about those dimensions of assessment tasks, um, particularly because we have such a rich area of languages, um, which has so many concepts to draw on. Here's a more creative task, I guess, to getting them to think about their language. So here you go, I'm being very creative. You're an actor and you've just landed a role in a new Spanish or could be any film um, and write a short post about yourself. Be sure to include a, a sort of a fake Insta page and include a picture. So trying to personalize and give them a, a more imaginative context. You might find that task is a stretch too far or you might wanna give them a choice of task. So that's another thing that we can do um, to make them more relevant for our students. Here's some other ones, um, if we, um, or this one, if we unpack it a little bit more. So does it allow for authentic communication? Are you integrating all aspects? And are you allowing them to, I guess, demonstrate that they, they have an understanding of the systems of language, um, as well as in um, bring in the ideas around culture and what would they have to do in order to undertake this task? So that's a, a different example that you may not have considered before. Here's another one. Um, write an email introducing yourself to a new pen pal at a sister school. So depending upon your language, it could be um, a relative or a community member and being sure to include some information. So again, these types of tasks um, are small tasks and they're quite manageable. And I think that's really important to break it down and to chunk it into things that students can really um, unpack and that you can give them a context for. An email is typically quite short. So if we're thinking about a written language task, we don't wanna make it such a long piece of writing. We want it to be something students can achieve and that we can get a snapshot of how they're going, whether they've got some of those sentence structures and whether they can use informal tones as well but they are talking about themselves. So kids love to do that. And it's helpful for us to, in terms of our teaching, to get to know them a little bit better. So here's some other examples um, that you might consider. Uh, I'm sure you've done many of these, um, but get them to listen to the weather report. Well, in Sydney and Western Sydney at the moment or throughout New South Wales, um, that's pretty interesting and, and happening and current. Um, and get them to answer the questions um, in English or in their teaching language. So the, here's a, an example of perhaps something that's at different levels um, where they would be speaking, listening and applying. Um, and then they can draw on another language or their first language, depending upon the students, to respond, to get the comprehension in. So, and it's something that's an everyday task and builds up their vocabulary as well. Um, another example is around, you know, hosting an exchange student, you, and obviously the language context would be different, um, and creating a video. So again, using the visual dimension as well as the speaking, um, and get them to actually think about what the weather is going to be like, um, what they should pack, and the activities. So give them a very rich context so that they can um, show you the concepts, they can demonstrate their vocabulary, and that you're giving them an audience and an authentic purpose for the task that they would hopefully really enjoy and be motivated for. So um, these are just some examples um, that we could look at. And I just have a, a couple more ideas. And then of course we can open up to some questions as well. So let's, let's look at maybe the last couple and just see how we go. Um, if there's some questions or maybe some experiences of these types of tasks that, that people have had um, already. So let me just throw up um, these types of key things. 
So quality assessment is um, giving them an authentic context. You must give them a scenario and that could be themselves or it could be um, taking on a different voice or perspective. Give them some of the, the cultural landscape as well. Make sure they're really clear about what type of text, um, so what's the product, who's going to be listening or viewing or reading or writing back to them or responding, um, why are they doing this and um, what they need to include because that's really helpful for our students. So I'm going to stop now before I probably show you the last um, activities uh, to see if there's some questions um, about these types of tasks or about this particular approach. So I'm going to stop share just for a minute and just have a look at the chat um, to see um, some people's responses. So I can see that a lot of people have tried a class, different ones. So has anyone tried a weather report or a letter or an email or some of these other types of approaches? Some people have tried letters, fantastic. Self-presentation, oh, beautiful, letters sent to Greece. Um, I can see letter seems to be a very popular one. Has anyone tried the, um, oh, some people have exchanged um, emails as well, which is great to get into the email form, um, responding to letters. Some of you have had conversations. Um, a poster is great. I see a beautiful one here about a letter to Mother's Day. So again, providing a different context. Um, and I think that's true. I think Yemen has a point here that the creative tasks um, can sometimes require a higher level of language skills. And so sometimes we need more basic um, entry points. Um, I see a suggestion here to write a postcard. So that can be a less formal type of piece of writing. And um, someone's even tried um, interviewing um, and getting perhaps people to introduce themselves as well. And I think Caroline, you've tried a mini drama. That's amazing. So we're getting lots of fantastic ideas. Um, even a message to grandparents, which is um, quite a lovely one to think about to build that connection with gener different generations. So I can see um, a huge amount of different things that people are trying. And in the chat, I think it's really worth having a, a quick look at some of the um, amazing ideas, particularly this one of Andrea, an audio play um, from the SBS. How did that go, Andrea? That's just quite an interesting one. Maybe you could share a little bit more, Andrea, with us. Okay, maybe a little bit later. All right, so let's have a look at some of the more um, basic level, entry level ones um, that you might find helpful to cater to students who perhaps haven't reached that higher level of language. Um, oh, Andrea, we, we can come back to you. We'd love to hear about the play. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm back now. Um, yes, um, it's Andrea from Deutsche Stunde. We've already done that. It's the just this last week was uh, the third time that we've done an audio play with the SBS. So what we do, we get our class to, in the different levels, usually our year five class, they're usually quite interested in that kind of stuff. And uh, we get them to either write or rewrite an audio play, like they've just done one on a fairy tale last week, which will hopefully will get sent out from SBS um, in about three or four weeks time. And, mm -hmm. um, and then the class performs it, like they learn their parts and they perform it at, at either at SBS radio, which we've done in the past where they've actually recorded it. And now because of COVID, the um, reporter came to us to the classroom last week mm -hmm. and um, they, um, so they perform, performed it as you do, well, you, they had to speak their, their stuff um, during the class and um, it got recorded and it worked really well. And the kids get really excited about it and it gets them to really, um, deepen their vocabulary because it's we try to find topics that they wouldn't normally do and uh, that's been really good fun one year they actually wrote the entire thing completely themselves and not just rewrote something and um, we've had all kinds of really funny versions and um, it's 
three or four times in a row that we've done it and it was great good fun for the kids and very engaging for everyone fantastic and thank you for sharing that it sounds like a really rich experience and uh, something a little bit different and I guess that's the point about making the assessment task really engaging and I think a few of us are going to maybe try some different ideas out um, I think the other thing that I noticed coming up is someone's written about an art exhibition gallery which obviously you'd have to get the students to talk through and perhaps act as guides as well um, and, and quite a high level task I can see coming up on the chat about comparing Australia education to perhaps a different country of origin. So you can see that you can take these up to more sophisticated tasks depending upon the, the topic and the students. Um, fantastic. That's so exciting to hear and see the chat. There's so many different views and ideas in terms of assessment. So I guess I'll, I'll just share perhaps there was a, a question earlier about are you hopefully seeing that last screen where we talked about context, product, audience, purpose and process? I think you are. Um, Andrew might give me a thumbs up because I can see her on my screen. Sorry to pick on you again, <laughs> if you can see that. Fantastic, thank you. So um, you can see that all those wonderful tasks that you put into the chat have those dimensions. And I think if you're wondering, is this a, a good task? Will this give me the information? Um, will I get um, good feedback for the students and obviously to our, our parents and other community members? Then I think these are the important things to consider in the task design. Um, good task design is what's going to drive um, the information. Without that, um, you're going to get very low level and you're not going to get the students engaged or motivated to, to do their best performance. So you want to give them a little bit of stretch um, and you want to be able to differentiate from those different levels of proficiency and you want to give them confidence. So you don't want them to fail in the task, but by giving them um, really clear success criteria and even what to include. So that last part about the process, what, that, what features are really important, what vocabulary or what concepts really helps the students to, to be successful. So some other tasks, I guess, that students could do, which might be, you know, at different levels of language proficiency. Um, clearly, um, there's a range here, and this might, you know, depending upon the stage of your students. So many of them in, in primary school um, might be interested in some of this. We talked about the weather, but whether they could research the weather in the, the teaching language country and actually compose the weather report and you can dramatize that. Um, obviously audio plays were very popular, but I mean, there could be a way to, to represent that in the classroom or to use videos to do that. Um, as an extension activity for the more capable students, you could get them to think about a local news story and delivering that in the teaching language. Um, or you could ask, give them different options to do that. Um, again, it's good to have tasks that are basic in some ways in terms of students having to demonstrate perhaps some more limited vocabulary and again gaining confidence, but also to have that stretch and enrichment of um, different off, jumping off points, so to speak. Um, we've talked a lot about emails and letters um, and introducing yourself, um, clearly uh, getting them to think about going overseas or, or going and staying with, with family, what they would say about themselves. So again, giving them that different um, audience. This one's quite interesting, I guess, with the um, New South Wales and Australian housing prices, but whether they um, could pitch, I guess, a real estate listing and thinking about um, perhaps homes or houses, um, you could get them to introduce their home as well. Welcome to my crib or my place. That's an interesting one. Uh, you could also do something that's a little bit richer and get them to think about a bilingual website. Um, and think about both English and their teaching language so they can build that vocabulary. But they're also being highly creative. Um, that website, you're giving them the context for the school, so something they know about, something they can research, and something that you could perhaps even put up, and that could be um, an important product for the school. So it's got that authentic and very relevant, I guess, approach. And the last one, I think, um, Probably many of you do assessments that are related to culture and possibly food. 
So here are some other, I guess, suggestions that I guess take up some of the more immediate forms of social media, but obviously these would be very sort of controlled and fake accounts, not the real thing. But many of our teenage students um, in the early years of high school uh, are, you know, very interested in these types of things and even setting up a food blog where they have both the visual and the vocabulary um, and then they can use words to describe that. So that can be introduce them to more persuasive forms of communication, build their vocabulary and also introduce a little bit of modality, which would be really important. Um, you can take it to a further extreme where you can get, you know, the chefs <laughs> Um, get them to act like the chef and take us through so you can develop procedural language as well as maybe that language of a food blogger or an influencer. So you can see um, I noticed in the chat that some of you talked about persuasive types of texts and tasks and that you know things like that can take that to the next level so it's not just about developing the vocab around you know food or different aspects of culture that they can be given a persuasive or influencing type of context because that's part of that dimension of negotiation and um, developing oral language um, in a variety of different formats. So there's some other suggestions for you that may be useful, um, although I do encourage you also to have a look at the chat because they were amazing types of assessment tasks as well. So I guess um, just to, to finish off, I think the importance of providing feedback to students about how they went in the task. And often the way to do that is to come back to the actual uh, outcomes and to make sure they realize where they are. You know, this is the amount of um, context they're able to provide done really well and why. And so that they can have a clear sense of what they need to do to go to the next level. Uh, so your feedback needs to be sometimes couched in, you know, two stars. These are two things that you've done as well in. Really detailed feedback, and this is an area for improvement. That can help students to really pinpoint and feel successful, but at the same time encouraged and empowered to move forward as well. So we've come um, almost to the end of our hour, and our apologies for the technical glitches. So I'm going to open it up to some questions. Um, just off and I'll unshare my screen so I can see you all as well and, and actually look at the chat. Okay, so questions that people may have that you can either ask or put in the chat. <laughs> so if you put your thumb up, if you'd like to ask a question, that would be really helpful. I have a question from you, man. Can feedback be verbal, um, like having a one-on-one -on -one conference with a student? Yeah, feedback, oral and verbal feedback is really powerful. And I think students gain a lot from that. Um, sometimes what I do is I build in some student conferencing time when the rest of the class may be doing a particular activity. Um, I might be able to have that one-on-one -on -one peer conference or student conference and give them individual feedback. And what I often do is then get them to acknowledge that feedback by writing down what they took away from it. So they write a statement based on that. And, you know, you can also create um, a little blog or a, a learner snapshot and you can have a, a separate folder or um, page on a Google Doc for each student. And you can profile from the beginning where they introduce themselves in terms of, you know, um, you know, in a letter or an email to you, you can then build up snapshots of different points in time where they've met um, particular milestones. And then when you come to do your reporting, you've got a whole wealth or a, almost a separate page or booklet for each student. Um, that's a great question. I'm just moving through. There's so many of you. Um, is it helpful to get feedback from the parents um, from Capstan? I think it is helpful to get feedback from parents um, to make sure that the parents are aware of where their children are at, um, even feedback in terms of their starting and what the context is and what learning goals they have for their young people. Um, I think it is good and to check in that the parents are aware of their development along the way. So 
Um, parents obviously want their children to do well, so it's good to let them know what the steps are and also to manage expectations, very much so. Uh, just trying to see if we have a few more. I might just go into the chat so we can see that, I can see that as well. Um, we have, is it worth explaining um, from asthma, the assessment beforehand? I think it's really helpful to let students know and talk it through and to spend um, a period of a lesson or possibly longer, depending upon the complexity of the task. Um, so I actually go through and, and give them extra information or clarifying questions that the whole class or individuals can raise and preparing them and getting them motivated for the assessment. Um, that can be a really powerful part. There's another question around um, what are some suggestions for students age range 6 to 14? So that's quite a wide range. So again, I would start with very basic tasks um, that may be around getting them to describe um, their family if they're a, a younger age group, um, what they like to do, their sports, maybe their pets. Um, and then when they get into teenagehood, maybe it's around um, there are other types of interests and you can think about changing the text type to more of that social media or more visual as well as oral and written presentations for those older groups um, and giving them something a bit more complex. Okay. Hey, I've got a quick question. Do you mind if yes. I... If I... <laughs> Jump in right there. I was um, just on the chat. Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Look, I thought um, before before we actually uh, finish up, you mentioned Bloom's taxonomy. Now, um, our schools are not necessarily familiar with it. Um, can you can you tell us if it's if it's still being used and what the well, actually what the benefits are of 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 uh, you know, actually in, involving the Bloom's taxonomy in their in their teaching? I know it's a huge question, but if we can just a it, quick. Just a quick question, Alex. So um, <laughs> yeah, do you want me sorry. to go back onto the screen to share that? I tell you what, I can, yeah, if you like. Okay, let's see if I can do that, seeing as I had so many other technical issues. I hope that's okay. Beautiful. Okay, so Bloom's Taxonomy has been around. It's, it's even older than me, I say. Um, it was developed a long, long time ago um, to actually um, work through the way we learn. So it's a taxonomy of actual thinking and in the early 2000s, it's been revised. So we have these terms at this higher level called creating. So it's used a lot in schools um, to, uh, I guess, part of the outcomes. A lot of the outcomes are written using this. So students can do these types of things. So often you'll see can describe, and then it moves up to explain, and then it might move up to analyze or evaluate. So often in the outcomes of each syllabus, we're using this taxonomy. When you get to your year 11 and year 12 groups, um, they're actually asked HSC style questions in this way. But the benefit is that ultimately, if you set a task and there's elements of all of these levels, so students go, I can remember one thing or I, I can identify one thing that I know, they can tick that off and they feel successful. And then you can ask them to explain a little bit more about that. And they go, oh, I can do that. And then you ask them to give them a new context, like writing that letter, to a sister school, you ask them to apply it, then you might ask them to research a little bit more about the local customs and give their perspective. And then you're asking them to evaluate or even create um, a new text. So what you're doing is you're actually producing success for every child at every level, and you're making sure that your task is quite creative and there's a little bit of challenge, which learning is about challenge and to do it in a fun and supportive way. So a lot of schools use this from the curriculum all the way through to how kids learn. And um, if you find that students are doing amazing creative things, then you know that that task is higher order and that you're really stretching them because when they can think in a creative way using their language, um, they, are, they are really you know, bringing it all together in a really rich and powerful way. They, so I think giving them a chance to use this language is really helpful. And it's quite simple because the verbs are, give us lots of options to set up tasks as well. And you can have a task where they do every single step, or you may have a task um, that starts here and then the next task builds up a little bit more as well in, in over a period of a term of learning. 
Alex, is that okay in terms of just you, you, that's that's wonderful. That's that's excellent. Thank you, thank you, Kate. Could I just um uh, we're, we're we're finished. We're out of time. But before everybody goes, I've got some information for you for your attendance. But um but I'd like to um thank Kay yet again. Uh, Dr. Kay Carroll from Western Sydney University. Thank you so, so much, Kay. It was, a, it was an excellent presentation, a lot of information for everybody. And, um, and we, will be, um, we will be posting the, um, the, the, like I said in the beginning, your, um, your presentation will be made available to our, to our teachers. And thank you so much for sharing that with us because you, you, you've obviously put in so, so much work. Kay, um, we hope to see you again sometime. Thanks again. And, um, and everybody, before you leave, um, could I just, I'm going to put in a, another very quick message for you all. Can you have a look, please, everybody, um, to make sure that if, you're, if you want to attend more sessions, I've just given you some links. Um, if you'd like some, if you'd like some uh, more information about, we've, we've got a conference coming up in April, have a look at the links. We've got uh, the material on YouTube, have a look at the links. We've got a masterclass happening uh, with somebody from Spain uh, in a few weeks. Have a look at the link. Um, everybody, thank you again for attending. We hope to see you again next week. It's the same Zoom login as, uh, as today. Invite your, your fellow colleagues. You're more than welcome to do so. And we hope to see you next week. Good night, everybody. And thanks again to Kay Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good night.